Okay, last time we talked about switching from vector spaces that uh, where the scalars are real numbers over to vector spaces where the scalars are complex numbers motivated by the need that we will have when, when we work through this chapter to, uh, to factor polynomials. So the, naturally the check-in talks about that. So you see it here. I'm um, doing two kind of vector spacey things with complex numbers instead of real numbers. All right, so let's have a whack. Let's see here. So the first thing is I want to represent, I want to represent, oops, number one, with respect to the standard basis, the, uh, the vector that is made of complex numbers. Okay, and the point here is that this is, this is very straightforward. So I'm just going to write 1 plus i, 2 minus i as a combination of 1, 0, and 0, 1. And it's just as simple as saying 1 plus i times and 2 minus i times. That's all. So in short, the representation with respect to the standard basis of the given vector, 1 plus i, 2 minus i is itself. So as happened before, as happened before, the advantage of the standard basis is that vectors represent themselves. So many of the things that we've seen before carry over when we move to this new place. Let's see, number two. Oh, I forgot already. It's a linear combination. It's sort of a very, uh, sort of the very heart of what it means to be a vector space, 2i. 3 plus 2i times uh, the vector is 2 plus i, 2, and uh, then minus i times uh, 1, 4. And again, we've seen, uh, yeah, I've talked about it last time, 2, 1, and 4, those are complex numbers. They're also real numbers, but they're also complex numbers. So this is a combination of uh, scalars and vectors where everybody is involved with, a with the a vector space over the complex number the, uh, the two-dimensional vector space over the complex numbers. Okay, so uh, let's do the combination. Let's see here. You get kind of good at combining the, uh, the complex numbers after a while. Uh, let's see how I do. So 3 times 2 is 6. 2i times i is minus 2. So 6 minus 2 makes 4. And then uh, 3 times i is 3i. 2 times 2 is, is uh, uh, 3i and 4i make 7i. And then on the bottom, 6 plus 4i. And then over here, I get uh, uh, minus, uh, oh, I guess I'm going to write plus, and then 4i. And then now I'm just doing arithmetic here, so that's always the hard part. <clears throat> Let's see, 4, so 4 plus 7i minus i. So I think I'm looking at 4 plus 6i. And 6 plus 4i take away 4i, so it's just 6. OK, so the usual computations that we've done through so, so, uh, so many times throughout the, uh, throughout the course here uh, are all carry over exactly, except that you have to uh, do maybe a little practicing multiplying a plus bi times c plus di. But except for that, you, uh, you know, the calculations all go pretty much the same way. OK, great. So we are ready now to start thinking about the material, uh, uh, the sort of heart of the chapter, the reason why, reason why we, we made the switch to complex numbers. And so uh, here we go. Similarity. So the basic idea is I want to combine, uh, excuse me, I want to uh, uh, take a special case of um, uh, matrix equivalence. So we define two matrices, H and H hat, to be equivalent. You remember this? If they express the same map, but with respect to different starting and ending bases. So I had an H, I had an H hat. So H and capital H and capital H hat are equivalent if they can be thought of as representing the same little h, but with respect possibly to different starting and ending bases. So that's matrix equivalence. It has a meaning. It's not just a definition about P, H, Q. It has a meaning. It means somehow, uh, uh, it means somehow describes the same thing, can be thought of as describing the same thing. 
I want to consider the special case of transformations. That is, I want to take little h to be a transformation. Instead of v and w, I want to have v and v. And it so happens that, in fact, I'm going to have v and v with both with respect to, to b and v and v both with respect to d. So I'm going to take all the v's and w's and make them v's and v's. Instead of b and d, I'm going to have b and b. Instead of, d, uh, instead of b hat and d hat, I'm going to have d and d. And so this picture on the bottom is just a, uh, a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a special case of the picture on the top. Okay. So uh, we've learned how to read these diagrams before. And so um, uh, let's see, uh, a t hat, t hat here, you can get by going straight over the representation with respect to dd of t. Or you can get t hat by going up, over, and then down. So the representation here uh, with respect to BD inverse, that's the up. Remember, it goes on the far side. It's a little tricky. Well, it's not tricky so much as it's easy to, to, to miss it, mess it up. So uh, the representation with respect to BD inverse, because you're going against the arrow, over is the representation with respect to BB. Down is the representation with respect to BD of the identity. Okay, so this picture is a special case of this picture in the context where you have a V and a V. We'll define that two matrices are similar if they, if they meet that picture. Two matrices are similar if there's a non-singular capital P where T hat is capital P, T capital P inverse. And I'm just reminding you, you're going to go back to the previous slide. So this is playing the role of capital P, and this is obviously capital P inverse. Okay, so uh, just as an example, one of my favorite examples here. So you consider the derivative map from P2 to P2. That's a natural map from a space to itself, a natural transformation of the space. I'm going to fix two bases, and I just, uh, as usual, I try to fix bases that aren't too easy and aren't too hard. But anyway, I fix, I fix B, B, B is sort of the kind of the easiest basis, but uh, I fix D to be at least not, not, uh, not ridiculously easy. So here we go. I'm going to calculate t, and then I'm going to uh, use that to calculate t hat. All right. So let's see how I do. So to calculate t, I, of course, have to find the effect of the derivative map on every one of the basis vectors in B. So the effect of the derivative map on 1, the effect of the derivative map on x, and the effect of the derivative map on x squared. I have to. Uh, uh, of course, we know what the derivative of 1 is. We know what the derivative of x is. And we know what the derivative of x squared is, you know, the 2x and sort of stuff. So now I have to represent, I have to represent with respect to the ending basis, but it's still b. So represent with respect to b the derivative of 1, which we know is 0. <laughs> I won't keep you in suspense. The, uh, I want to represent with respect to ending basis the derivative of x, which we know is, is 1, the polynomial 1 plus 0x plus 0x squared. Anyway, 1. And re represent with respect to, uh, to b the, the derivative of x squared, which we know is the polynomial 0 plus 2x plus, uh, plus 0x squared. There we go. That wasn't hard. Did, did that all by i. So what I get is the matrix capital T is put together the, the, the three vectors, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 2, 0. There you go. That's the representation with respect to, in some sense, the natural basis or the canonical basis for poly 2 of the derivative map. So uh, next, to, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Next, of course, I have to worry about, uh, I have to worry about the representation with respect to B comma D of the identity map. All right, so there we go. So uh, the representation with respect to b comma d of the identity map. So I write down the bases, the, the members of uh, capital B. So 1, x, and x squared. I apply the identity map to them. I know it's silly, but if you do every problem the same way, that's a good technique for teaching, is to do every problem the same way. And then people start saying, after 5 or 6 or 10 or however many, people start saying, you know, you could have skipped that step. And at that point, they're ready to skip the step. So anyway, the identity, 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 you could skip that step. Represented with respect to the output basis. Again, going back to the picture, I just think the picture is such a help represented with respect to the output basis. 
the output basis is 1, 1 plus x, 1 plus x plus x squared, and it's easy enough to, that a person can eyeball the answer. The representation of 1, the representation of x with respect to 1, 1 plus x, 1 plus x squared, and the representation with respect to, to 1, 1 plus x, 1 plus x plus x squared of, uh, of x squared. You put those three together into a matrix, and there you go. Okay. So I put these three together into a matrix, and there I go. Here we go, back to reminding myself what I'm doing. I have this picture. I put those three together into a matrix. That's the right-hand side. It's easy to get confused, left and right. That's the right-hand side. That's what on the next screen I called capital B. Here is what I called capital T. Here is uh, capital P inverse. There is capital P. Capital B inverse I found in the usual find the matrix inverse way. You could, if you wanted, do this computation going in the other direction. But anyway, I found the inverse of this matrix by, you remember, you write down the matrix and you write the identity to it. And then you do Gauss-Jordan elimination and you end up with the, ident with the inverse. So there it is. OK, so here are the parts. There's T. There's P, there's P inverse. When you multiply together P times T times P inverse in that order, when you multiply together P times T times P inverse, that means you're following this diagram. And you get this. So, so we have this. All right, we've calculated, basically calculated the bottom line of that, uh, of that arrow, arrow diagram. Now, to check that, to just to underline what the arrow diagram says, of course, I'm going to compute it by hand. So I'm going to compute the representation with respect to D of uh, little t here. So the representation with respect to D of the derivative map. Uh, all right. So, um, so here, is the, the, here is the effect of the derivative map on the members of capital D. So capital D excuse me, the derivative maps affect on 1, the derivative maps affect on 1 plus x, and the derivative maps affect on 1 plus x plus x squared. So we know what the derivative of 1 is. We know what the derivative of 1 plus x is. We know what the derivative of 1 plus x plus x squared is. I finally, to get the representation, I have to represent those with respect to the output basis, which is, again, d. So represent 0 with respect to 1 comma 1 plus x comma 1 plus x plus x squared. There it is. Represent the quadratic polynomial 1 plus 0, x plus 0, x squared with respect to 1 comma 1 plus x comma 1 plus x plus x squared. And there it is. You can do those by i for sure. And then finally, represent 1 plus 2x with respect to 1 comma 1 plus x comma 1 plus x plus x squared. And obviously, 1 plus 2x, you need a 2 for the x, and it's like that. And of course, that, that better be the same answer as I got earlier, and it is. Okay, the definition, of course, the definition of, uh, here we go, back to, go. the definition of similarity is phrased in terms of matrices, so strictly speaking, it doesn't require me to think about the underlying maps. I can just compute the matrices, and sometimes that's what we want to do. If you give me a T and a B, I can, of course, compute uh, uh, P times T times P inverse, provided that you can find the inverse for P. And so I just computed it. The point here is that, that you, I don't have to think about the underlying maps. I can simply do the matrix computation. We take the point of view in this class that the underlying maps, um, that understanding the underlying maps gives a person an idea about where all the definitions come from, what are all these computations supposed to be talking about. But, but uh, you know, we're going to be pragma pragmatic, is that if, uh, if simply doing the matrix computations gets the, you know, gets the sort of clear answer, the number will simply do the matrix computations. So the, so the definition doesn't require me to open it up and figure out what is the underlying map. I can just simply compute. The only matrix similar to the zero matrix is if you take P times Z times P inverse, then you get P times Z, which is Z. And the identity matrix has the same property because of p, p times i gives you p, and then p, p inverse gives you i. So the zero matrix and the identity matrix have the property that they are similar only to themselves. 
Now, other matrices are similar. It's possible these two matrices are similar, so these matrices are related. But the zero matrix is sort of related only to itself. The identity matrix is related only to itself. So some matrices are, are kind of alone, and some matrices have friends. <laughs> So, of course, you've seen this, um, I don't know, maybe a half dozen times in this course now, you know where we're going. Similarity is an equivalence relation. That is to say, similarity breaks the universe of all matrices up into, uh, into subsets. Some matrices are similar to each other, some matrices are not. Matrices that are similar belong in the same part. Matrices that are not similar belong in separate parts. So we can, in some sense, understand what matrices are about by saying all of these matrices represent the same transformation in that arrow diagram picture. All of these matrices represent the same transformation in that arrow diagram picture. And so these are somehow all the same, whatever that means. Now, matrix similarity is a special case of matrix equivalence. That's what I meant at the beginning of, uh, you know, beginning of this video, when we took the matrix equivalence uh, picture and specialized it by writing VV instead of VW. That is, I took W to BV kind of thing. So matrix similarity is a special case of matrix equivalence. So it follows from that, because it's a special case, that if two matrices are similar, necessarily they are equivalent. But what about the converse? If two matrices are equivalent, must they necessarily be similar? They've got to be square to be, to be uh, similar. And the answer is no. Just as an example, the matrix equivalence class of the identity matrix, you might remember, the matrix equivalence class of the identity matrix consists of all non-singular matrices, all matrices that represent an isomorphism, all non-singular matrices of that size. But in the, just a second ago, we showed that the similarity class of the identity matrix contains only one, one matrix. So matrix similarity is, is, takes the matrix equivalence classes and breaks them up into smaller parts. You can have two matrices S and T that are similar. Those are going to be square matrices. You can have two matrices S and T that are similar, but that are not equivalent. Okay, now just to name an example, take S to be the 3x3 three three identity matrix, and take T to be uh, any 3x3 three three matrix of rank 3, that when you do Gauss's method on it, you end up with out any zero rows. You end up with uh, three different non-zero rows. Okay, so similarity gives a finer partition than does equivalence. Similarity breaks the universe of cases up into smaller cases. So, of course, we've done this many times before now, a half dozen times anyhow. What we want is a canonical form to represent the similarity classes. We want to say, give me a, a good representative of this similarity class. Give me a good representative of this similarity class. Give me a good... So we want to represent here the, the similarity classes. And the, the thrust here of this chapter will be that some classes, not all, but some classes, are represented by a diagonal matrix. Okay? And so we'll talk about that next time. We're going to talk about diagonalizability. That's the next topic. When can you find a matrix similar to the one you have that is a diagonal matrix? Again, when can you find a matrix that fits the arrow diagram that you have, but, but, the, but the matrix you're finding is diagonal, so easy to understand. Matrix you're finding is diagonal matrix. It's all zeros except for possibly non-zero entries on the diagonal. Okay, very good. See you next time.